Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! There's been plenty of government business over the summer, with Brexit negotiations continuing in Brussels last week. Today, though, MPs return to Westminster, and on Thursday, they'll debate the EU withdrawal bill. There are certain to be critical voices, but when it comes to votes, is the government likely to suffer any defeats? The government currently has a working majority of 13, thanks to the support of the DUP. There are, however, nine Labour MPs who supported leave during the EU referendum. If these Labour MPs support the bill, this would give the government a larger Brexit majority of 31. That means the opposition would need around 16 Conservative MPs to rebel in order to defeat the government. Former Business Minister Anna Soubry said yesterday that she had given Theresa May an absolute assurance that she and others would not vote against the bill at second reading. There could be closer votes as the bill advances through Parliament. One point of controversy in the bill is expected to be so-called Henry VIII powers, clauses which give ministers the freedom to make changes to the law with less parliamentary scrutiny. In a moment, I'll be talking to Liberal Democrat leader Vince Cable. But first, let's talk to our political editor, Laura Kunzberg. Welcome to the programme. So, Thank Parliament's you. back. Yes, we're all You're here. back. Lovely to be back. Yes, looking forward to the months ahead. Mm -hmm. Theresa May is fighting on, mm -hmm. as she said, over the summer. But there are dangers, big dangers ahead, potentially. Let's talk about that EU withdrawal bill. With a small majority, how difficult could Tory rebels and opposition parties make life for her. Well, they could make it very hard, very painful, very grumpy, very fractious. There isn't, however, a sense at this point that on the Tory backbenches, those who supported Remain have got any desire to somehow sink the government to bring it all crashing down. As you just outlined, the numbers are so tight that a really small number of them could actually do so if they really felt like it. And with a working majority of 13, it would only take six Tory rebels, in fact, just six of them, to defeat the government on any of it. But although they've got real concerns about those Henry VIII powers and, frankly, a whole variety of issues around the withdrawal bill, there isn't, at the moment, an appetite to really, really do the government damage. Are they going to make it difficult? Are they going to try to make it demands? Absolutely. But are they going to try to carry out a sucker punch on Theresa May at a time when she's very fragile, not at this stage. I think the challenge for the government, as one minister put it to me yesterday, is to work out what's just grandstanding, because there's going to be a lot of that, it's mm. Westminster after all, and where are their actual genuine attempts to try to make this a better bit of legislation? Because cabinet ministers privately acknowledge they will have to budge in some areas. Now, Brexit obviously mm. is the huge dominating issue yeah. for many people, but there is a domestic agenda. Yeah. And it seems that Number 10 wants to remind mm -hmm. voters and us that they are still going to pursue a domestic agenda and perhaps park their tanks on Labour's lawn. I think that's certainly the case for two reasons. One, when Theresa May moved into number 10, she was obviously, visibly more passionate about the changes she wants to make in this country than the European issue. I think that's quite clear. She's never been one of the Tory politicians to be sort of obsessed by the European agenda. But here she finds herself having to do that as the biggest piece of business. So she herself personally wants to get things done. She wants to make changes to education. She wants to make changes in mental health, a whole variety of issues. The second reason is the huge Tory election disappointment for that party mm also reminded them if they are to be in a position again of being a winning and convincing party, they've got to talk to the public more about things that they actually care about. Including lifting the public sector pay cut. Well, here we are again in June, July, after the election, that was a continual source of speculation, messages from parts of government, cabinet ministers who made it absolutely clear around the cabinet table after the election, they wanted to see movement. But we'll see. It's up to the Chancellor in a few weeks' time to write a letter to the snappily titled SSRB, mm. the Because they set out the remit, Exactly, don't they? because yeah. it's one of these strange issues, this public sector pay. It's independently set by independent bodies who guarantee that independence, who guard it very carefully. But they're, of course, operating in a political 
context. And it was interesting, the first example of this we actually had after the election, where you'd had cabinet ministers saying, we've got to do something about this, a whole load of noise is off. The first independent body that came back, the teachers review body, came back sticking to the 1%, but making it very clear they'd only done that through gritted teeth because ministers had made it clear they weren't going to be able to do anything else. Well, thank you for marking our cards, uh, Laura. <laughs> let's talk to Vince Cable, the Liberal Democrat leader, and let's return to the issue of Brexit. Because you've called for an exit from Brexit. In fact, it's tougher mm. language than we heard from your predecessor, who certainly claimed to accept the referendum result. You don't. No, we're not, we're not talking about accepting the referendum result. We are talking about having a new referendum. You could call it a first referendum on the facts. Once we know what the outcome of the negotiations is, we're in a different position from where we were when the referendum took place. And we think the public should have a choice then. Do they want to proceed on the basis which they know that the government has secured? Or do they want an exit from Brexit? Right, so you've become the Remain Party. We are essentially the Remain Party. Right. That's right. But there will be many who say you, you haven't accepted the first referendum, whatever uh, you want to call it, which did say that we should leave the EU. But if, if it emerges that leaving the EU is so messy, so complicated, so damaging, I think, as I think David Davis once put it, in a democracy people have the right to change their minds and we'd like to give them that right. What do you say, Graham Brady? I think the danger is that what Vince is advocating is the never end. It's the possibility that we go from necessarily a rather tricky, complicated couple of years of uncertainty to another referendum followed by more years of uncertainty, presumably followed by another referendum to say whether or not we accept the outcome of that. This is a never-ending process. Mm -hmm. uh, the country's made a decision. We now need to get it right for the good of the country. Why are you thwarting it? Uh, we're not thwarting it. We, we, we think there are a whole lot of problems coming down the track. I think the process of leaving the European Union is going to be far more difficult, far more costly, far more messy than was envisaged. The government are clearly not ready for it, which is apparent in the negotiations. And we think there needs to be check. I mean, I, to a, a degree, I, I, I accept this point that, you know, the never-ending world, I would rather we'd never have got into trying to resolve this through the referendum. Sure, but is route. your policy but, uh, going to lead to that? We are where we are. That's the way it started. And the only way of dealing legitimising the referendum we've had is to have another one. But we, we need to know what the facts are. We need to know where the country's got to. And then we can have a rational decision on whether we're to jump off a cliff or stay where we are. Right. Do you support the EU withdrawal bill? In other words, the adoption of all the EU legislation into British law? No, we don't accept it as it is. And there are two basic points here. I mean, one is the process issue, the, the so-called Henry VIII clause. This. Well, well, we'll come to the, that the, in a moment. But the, but the sort of substance of the bill, you don't even support the fact that actually by adopting EU legislation, that will allow continuity and certainty when the UK leaves. Well, th that would be fine if it were just adopting everything that currently exists automatically. But of course, once you take away from Parliament supervision of legislation and institutions and you give the executive power, there is nothing to stop them. For example, let's just take a, a random case, you know, air quality and environment. It, they may just adopt the European standards as they are and that's the end of it. But it may be that in translating it into British law, they wish to dilute the standards. So there is an is the, the, the issues around process and substance are not completely separate. Why are you supporting the idea of giving more power to the executive? You're a champion of backbenchers and less power to Parliament. I am. And I think this is a really tricky point. What we need to do now is an enormous amount of legislative change in a very short period, precisely because we want that continuity, we want that clarity that the laws are going to be the same, that businesses and individuals can rely on that. But we you don't do, know they're going to be the same. As Vince we, Cable we, we says, do, of course, we, the executive we because, be, could we because the decide government, the, to dump some the rights has, and the keep others. The government has made it very, very clear that those standards will be the same or higher. Uh, we, of course, you know, and it's a, a nonsense to suggest these are the only opportunities that Parliament will have to hold the executive to account. There are so many vehicles through which to do that. If they were to break faith on those things, we could, of course, bring them back to Parliament and stop it from happening. But in effect, you are happy to give up some of the parliamentary scrutiny that you have always said, along with many of your colleagues on the backbenches, is so critical I, I think, to actually making I, I, the executive I think the government is doing the right thing in keeping faith with a promise, which is that the repeal of the European Communities Act will be followed by the replication of all of that law in British law. That 
can only be done through this mechanism. And I think if Vince tried to change the mechanism, we would necessarily miss all of the deadlines that are involved. What, what difference can you actually make, though, Vince Cable, with 12 Liberal Democrat MPs? Oh, with our 12 MPs and our rather larger number of peers, we, we can make an intervention, but it's clearly a, not... A wrecking sort no, of intervention? not wrecking. We will, um, my, um, my phrase is constructive opposition. That's where I want us to be. <laughs> but we right. will be, we'll be working with people in other parties who share our concerns, both on the constitutional issues, which Graham has acknowledged exist, and, and the issues of substance staying in the single market and the customs union where the jobs who, and the economic future. Who are you going to be working with in the other parties? Because it's not clear in the Labour Party exactly how big the appetite is um, in terms of supporting the philosophy that you have outlined. Yes, they've now said they want to stay in the single market and customs union during a transition period, mm. but beyond that, no further. And actually, John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn are not enthusiasts for remaining in the single market. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a wonderful lack of clarity about right. what the Labour so You can't rely want. on them to help uh, your well, 12 Liberal Democrat MPs. They may well MPs. agree with us on particular issues. And I think they've moved a bit, and in an important way, that they have accepted that if there is a transition, mm. it's got to be within the single market and the customs union. But you're quite right, the Labour Party are all over the place in telling us where we go after that. Right, so you can't rely on them in terms we can, of support. We, and, we and may be able to vote with them collectively or with large groups of backbenchers who are very unhappy about it, with some Conservatives who are unhappy about it. Have you it. spoken to some Conservative backbenchers? Of course, Parliament, right. Parliament is, is a collegiate place. <laughs> we, we have good relations. We, you do talk to people from we, other we parties. To, we're not totally tribal. Right, which amendments are you going to plan to put down then when it comes to the committee stage, which is the stage after the the second reading and after the vote next well, week? Well, we've, we've already prepared a reasoned amendment for the second reading and we'll see whether the Speaker takes that and whether it's voted on. But beyond that, we will be, we'll be proceeding through the detail as it comes. Right. What do you say to your Tory colleagues? Anna Soubry has said, of course, she won't be voting down. She said the second reading. But when it comes to scrutiny and when it comes to those powers that we've talked about, she will be looking at amendments. That's her job. And they need to make their own judgments, and that's something you know, I think it is a, a difficult and complicated job being a member of parliament, precisely because you have to balance these issues of scrutinising legislation, standing up sometimes for your party, especially if you're in government. And I, I think Anna and others have so far been pretty clear that they are striking a balance in this. They don't want mm. uh, to damage the government, and they don't want to set in train a course of events that would be harmful to the country. Did the former Brexit minister yesterday on this programme speak out of turn then when he said that? she really needed to look at where her loyalty lies. Well, for all of us, our loyalty is to our country, uh, first and foremost. Uh, but I think we are obviously in a very delicately poised parliament with small uh, majorities involved in all sorts of important things. Uh, of course, people need to think very carefully how they vote. Why do you think there's any support for your position when you look at the general election result? And actually, the polls haven't moved when it comes to the referendum result. There isn't much evidence of buyer's remorse, and your vote share actually went down in the general election. So why are you pursuing a strategy that isn't going to be a vote winner for you? Well, we don't know what's going to happen in the next two years. Well, the, the government already but, but it, at the beginning of the it wasn't at the general election, was it? it, it oh, didn't... The, the general election was in a, in a very different context. The process of negotiation hadn't properly started. Uh, there was a lot of uh, debate about what soft and hard Brexit actually meant. I think a lot of people took our second referendum commitment as rerunning the last one. But do you think people haven't understood them. the issues now um, and that they are suddenly going they, to have a Damascene conversion? I mean, the economic consequences are just beginning to become apparent through the exchange rate and it's affecting people's living standards, but it hasn't been dramatic one way or the other. But this will gradually emerge over time. You know, the complexities of extricating ourselves from, you know, things like Euratom, the Open Skies mm. Agreement, all of this will start to hit people in a direct way that affects their lives. So you're hoping everything will just go wrong? That's what you're uh, hoping? No, I'm not ho I'm hoping that the country uh, is in the right place eventually. And I believe that what is right for the country is that we stay within the institutions like the single market, the customs union, the collaborative research, the good environmental standards that have served this country well. Vince Cable, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Well, let's get more now on what looks like it's going to be a tricky week for the government on Brexit. Uh, joining me now is the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Vince Cable. Uh, good to talk to you, Mr Cable. Uh, let's just talk before we, we move on to Brexit, to talk briefly about public sector pay. Uh, a lot of speculation uh, today that the Prime Minister is going to remove the 1% public sector pay cap. Do you think it's the right time to do this? 
Yes, and it's overdue. Uh, I mean, seven years ago, we were in the middle of a massive financial crisis, and there was a need for restraint. There was a fear of large-scale unemployment. We're now faced with very large recruitment problems, labor shortages in teaching, in nursing, in the police force and elsewhere, and the cap should go, and uh, the public sector workers should be allowed to incorporate inflation properly in the pay. How will that be funded, though? Well, the, the government's made it very clear that it can fund it within the, the margins that they have. Um, and, and to be frank, the, the, the costs of not doing it may well outweigh the costs of doing it, because if you're having to bring you know, agency workers, for example, into the health service on a large scale, then there are very substantial costs. So there are costs of not doing things, apart from the costs of actually getting this right. Mm. <laughs> Should everybody in the public sector, you know, should it be removed for everybody or do you think it should just be for the most needy or perhaps the ones that are perceived as being the most needy? Well, there, is a, there are complicated negotiating mechanisms, public sector pay awards, and it, it's got to operate through them. But in principle, um, the public sector pay cap applies across the public sector. We're talking, I think, ultimately about five million people. Uh, and, you know, they should be lifted from this restriction because the effect of it uh, is that if you only have a 1% increase, inflation is going at 3% plus, uh, your pay is being cut by 2% a year, and that's on top of, of a, quite a long period in which earnings have been falling in real terms. Uh, there, there are those, of course, who argue that um, in the private sector that the pay hasn't also gone up as much. Uh, do you think that the, it would then follow that the private sector would then start pushing for, for bigger pay rises? Well, the, you know, that's very much up to individual companies and the people who represent them. I mean, there is, there is a very varied story in the, in the private sector. Uh, you know, there are some people who are extraordinarily well paid and you've seen the progression at chief executive and senior management level, but there are also a lot of very low paid workers who, but they are being protected at the bottom, of course, with the minimum wage and the living wage, which has been gone up faster than inflation. So uh, low, low paid private sector workers have had some help uh, and the problem at the moment is very much on these key public sector services where there is an acute shortage of labour. Uh, let's move on to Brexit now. Um, how much do, do you think we should be paying to leave the EU? Well, I'm not coming up with a sum. I didn't create this problem. I would rather we weren't in this problem. But the government, but you're good I with think, maths, if, aren't you? You must have an idea of what you think no, is, I, I, a, is a no, fair I'm, number. I, I, I'm not. I would tell the government to stop and just think again about the whole project of what they're doing. But they are going to have to pay. Um, there are certain elements. I think there is an understanding that where Britain has entered into projects, which are continuing till, say, the year 2020, that's the planning horizon, they are going to fulfil the British costs because... You know, they were projects have been started with our agreement. That applies to things like university research. There's also the pensions of people as part of the European institutions. Um, the, the, more controversially, there is the question about how much the government should be paying in order to keep access to the single market and the, the customs union arrangement. And that's uh, an issue they haven't yet conceded in principle, but they'll almost certainly have to. But it's an issue that has to be resolved, isn't it? Because, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, the population did vote to leave the EU. The government is simply following uh, their decision and it has to reach an agreement. And you, you can see why the EU would say, as you, as you say, you know, you've agreed to pay for all of these things. You must give us the money. Well, the government has already accepted that in some of those key areas, like major projects, which we have signed up to, there is a moral and as well as a practical obligation to pay, and the dispute is about how much. I do worry that the British government is horribly unprepared. They've left this all very, very late. The complexities of this process are immense. Uh, and there's a real danger that we just finish up, uh, you know, crashing out of the arrangements at the end of these negotiations, which we're completely ill-prepared for and will have massive economic consequences. Uh, and that's why, actually, the government's got to get real quickly about those subjects over which it's got some kind of control. And the budget settlement is one of them. Nationality rights are another. The Irish border's the third. If those issues can be resolved quickly, uh, then they can move on to the serious negotiations about our future trading relationships. Mm. I mean, the government would say that they are, they are doing it professionally. David Davis has been working across the summer with it. We are hearing from him that he wants to speed up negotiations. I mean, is that something that you do welcome? 
Well, if that's sincere and if they are ready and they are prepared, of course we welcome that. I, you know, we're all following this from a distance. I get the impression that the papers that the government's been putting up are really sort of options papers. They're not serious uh, offers to, on a take it or leave it or negotiating basis. And it's very clear that the government was horribly unprepared for the sheer complexity of what's involved. I mean, the issue around you know, payments, the issue around nationality and the, the position of Europeans living in Britain, Britain's living in Europe, there, there are many different dimensions of this and they're only just beginning to get to grips with one or two of the more obvious uh, implications of it. So the, the government set this deadline, the, the Europeans didn't. Um, the, the government went into these negotiations unprepared. Uh, we're now beginning to see it getting into very sticky conditions. Whether it ultimately fails, I sincerely hope not, because I think the consequences could be dire. But um, although the Europeans you know, should be as flexible as possible, think of the lot of responsibility lies on the British side. It was, after all, the UK who went for the divorce, not them. Mm. We were hearing uh, some lines coming out of lobby. Of course, it's the first cabinet meeting uh, of the new term this morning. Uh, hearing that David Davis has been clear to cabinet that there was progress last week in constructive and significant areas. Does that give you any hope at all? Well, if that's real, um, I, I would welcome it. And uh, you don't David think it's Davis, I think cabinet, he's do you? David Davis is coming before uh, Parliament this afternoon, and if he strikes that tone, and if there is genuine evidence of real progress, I think everybody will be uh, much reassured. OK, Vince Cable, good to talk to you. Thanks Thank very you. much for joining us. Thank you. Today was the first chance after the summer recess for MPs to look at the Brexit negotiations. The Brexit Secretary, David Davis, has said there are what he called significant differences with the European Commission over the so-called divorce bill Britain will have to pay when it leaves the European Union. Here's our deputy political editor, John Pienaar. Bonjour. What did you do this summer? David Davis tried to get Brexit talks into high gear, but it's been tough, and colleagues like Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson are demanding hardball with Brussels. Pity officials, so much to do, so little time. Jeremy Corbyn's team look up for it. Labour's EU policy is not all clear. His deputy talks of maybe staying inside the EU system on trade and customs. His Brexit spokesman doesn't go that far. But Labour is pledged to challenge ministers on Parliament's role, judging Brexit. The devolved Assembly's role too, on workers' rights. Statement the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. First day of term meant time to answer questions and face the sceptics. And while at times these negotiations have been tough, it's clear that we've made concrete progress on many important issues. Britain was nowhere near agreeing the Brexit divorce bill, or as he put it... There are significant differences to be bridged in this sector. So not easy, but not Britain's fault. The UK's approach is substantially more flexible and pragmatic than that of the EU as it avoids unnecessary disruption for British business and consumers. Labour, of course, wasn't buying it. No deal, which I had hoped had died a death since the election, could yet rise from the ashes. His message, get real. The truth is that too many promises have been made about Brexit which can't be kept. Today, Labour's decided to vote against the bill, turning all EU legislation into British law, ready to be kept in or weeded out later. If and when they lose that vote, it'll just be the start of something like parliamentary siege warfare, while Labour looks to win over the handful of Tory rebels they need to pull ministers up short. Impatient with Brexit, it's just the start. <laughs> The two big parties are in tune on respecting the referendum, now nothing else. How are you feeling about progress on Brexit? <laughs> There's progress on Brexit? They'll argue like hell, they'll say, oh, it's impossible, and in the end, they'll agree that they've got to agree and it will be done. This demo wanted Brexit stopped. Many, many don't. But while UK and EU negotiators play a game of who blinks first, a vision of economic uncertainty and political storms ahead now seems plain to see. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. Now, the European Commission is using pressure tactics to force Britain to pay up for Brexit, according to the Brexit Secretary, David Davis. On Parliament's first day back after the summer, he told MPs that if he gave in to the demands the bill could be as large as 100 billion euros. 
Labour's shadow Brexit secretary, Keir Starmer, said the slow progress of the negotiations was being caused by the Prime Minister's deeply flawed red lines. Well, our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in Westminster. Gary, first day back for MPs. Will it be back-to-back -back Brexit from them? Pretty much. Uh, there will be other um, appearances by other subject matters as there was today in the Commons, but that is more or less what you're in for. You got a flavour of it if you were sitting, sadly I wasn't, at Cabinet uh, today. A flavour too in the shadow Cabinet meeting, Labour front benches agreeing that they are going to vote against that central Brexit bill uh, in the vote uh, for the second reading on Monday. And the Commons was back, David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, reporting back on the negotiations that happened while the uh, Commons was on its holes. Uh, David Davis at one point uh, being mocked by Labour MPs because he said, uh, slightly excusing some of the slightly uh, slower progress over the summer, saying nobody said this was going to be easy. And uh, quite a few Labour MPs could uh, recall a little bit of chapter and verse of when certain, not all, uh, uh, supporters of Brexit had said in the past, actually, this would be relatively easy. Anyway, uh, David Davis told them what uh, progress had been made over the summer. And as you can hear from this clip, Labour MPs were fairly unimpressed. And while at times these negotiations have been tough, it's clear that we've made concrete progress on many important issues. <laughs> the parties appear to be getting further apart rather than closer together. If phase two is pushed back, there are fair, very serious consequences for Britain. And no deal, which I had hoped had died a death since the election, could yet rise from the ashes. But what does he, what does he actually want the British government to do? Because what is the Commission doing? The Commission is saying, unless, unless we give approval that sufficient progress has been made, we will not go on to the main substance of the negotiation, the ongoing rights. And what are they seeking to obtain from that? They're seeking to obtain money. That's what it's about. Now, does the Labour Party want to pay 100 billion euros in order to get progress in the next, in the next month? Is that what they're about? Right? So that's what they were saying. What did we learn from those exchanges? Well, David Davis at one point said he was pretty sure that the whole business of the bill for Brexit won't be settled till the very end of the negotiations, exactly uh, what Brussels doesn't particularly want to hear him stamping his feet about at the moment, but possibly what they privately uh, suspect will happen. And we heard him say that the transition uh, period, which he insists on calling the implementation period, uh, will be over by the time of the next general election, which uh, has to happen under law by 2022. Gary, thanks very much. Fatima. Well, while the politicians are in deadlock, British manufacturers are getting their heads down. Helped by strong demand from abroad and a weak pound, new figures today show that exports are at a record high, confounding those who thought the Brexit vote would spell inevitable doom. But the outlook is not so sunny across the rest of the economy, with the service sector and the construction industry both showing a slowdown in August. Here's our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy. For British manufacturers like this clockmaker, the good times are finally starting to roll. The pastels have been making classic timepieces since 1922. Pretty much everything here will be sent out in the next couple of days. Uh, this is generally for Spain on this side. They did feel an immediate hit after the Brexit vote, but business has picked up since, and now exports are growing at their fastest pace ever. Our growth in the last 12 months uh, since Brexit has probably been about 9-10% in, in export through Europe, so that's quite encouraging. Uh, and we're projecting that growth to continue for the next 12 months. So there's no sign of it at the moment slowing down. His success is echoed across the sector, where today new figures show over a third, that's an all-time high, of manufacturers saw their output increase during the three months to September. Overseas demand is up 12% compared to the previous quarter, and just under 60% say they've increased their exports into the EU. That's the case here too, and with a weaker pound, exports are also up to the US and Australia. But it's here in the UK that demand for their custom-made clocks and jewellery boxes has been more challenging. Traditional retail is really suffering. Uh, and I just think consumer confidence this year, I think, will be down as people do tighten their belts and perhaps are more considered about their purchases across the board. Exports might be lifting British manufacturers, but they're failing to lift the economy overall. We're still importing more than we're exporting, leaving the UK with a stubbornly widening trade deficit. 
we're exporting a lot more at the moment because the global economy is doing well, but we still have a big trade deficit um, because we have to import um, components and raw materials that we don't necessarily produce enough of in the UK from other parts of the world. And a lot of that is coming in from Europe. So until we invest more in new businesses or existing businesses scale up, um, that balance um, is going to exist. The problem is, with Brexit looming, businesses old and new are reluctant to invest, so we're likely to remain a net importer for some time to come. As ever with the British economy, it's a mixed bag. While manufacturing may be a highlight, other data today shows a slowdown in the services sector, things like cinemas and restaurants, which make up 80% of our economy. And the same goes for construction. As prices continue to rise and consumer confidence gets hit by uncertainty, chief among them Brexit. No one's calling time on the economy just yet, certainly not this manufacturer. But there are some worrying signs that the wheels are slowing. Siobhan Kennedy there. Parliament returned to work today and it was straight back down to the business of Brexit, with Labour promising to throw a serious spanner into the proceedings. Labour has told its MPs to vote against the European Union withdrawal bill next Monday, not because it doesn't want to uphold the result of the referendum. Rather, it's worried that it, in its current form, the bill would let the government grab powers from Parliament over things like workers' rights and consumer protection. Westminster was back in action today. Many MPs returning from summer holidays. The Brexit secretary returning from a trip to Brussels, which few here believe went especially well. And while at times the negotiations have been tough, it's clear that we've made concrete progress on many important issues. He admitted that on the issue of a final bill, the UK and the EU were far apart. It's clear that the two sides have very different legal stances. Generally, we should not underestimate the usefulness of the process so far, but it's also clear that there are significant differences to be bridged in this sector. And today, at this meeting of the Shadow Cabinet, another problem for the government. Labour agreed they would oppose the EU withdrawal bill, which comes to Parliament on Thursday, unless it is radically altered. This bill is a constitutional nightmare. We don't oppose the transfer of those powers into UK law, what we oppose is the way in which this government is going about it. The problem is the so-called Henry VIII clauses, which allow ministers to change laws without coming back to ask Parliament. The government says they need that to make all that EU law, which is coming into UK law, work in its new context. But opponents here in Parliament say the government is asking for sweeping powers. There are also Conservatives who are worried about this. While it's true that the government has, does take such powers with ordinary legislation, the scope of that legislation is usually very limited. In this case, the scope of the legislation is almost unlimited, and that's the problem. But the Remainers outside Parliament can't count on Tory rebels to upset Brexit just yet. Most say they'll try to amend the bill later. Even so, the government faces a tight vote on a big bill just days into the new term. Carl Dinan, News at 10, Westminster. And our political editor, Robert Pesson, is here in the studio with me. Robert, does um, Labour's opposition to the withdrawal uh, bill signal a shift in its position over the summer? Do you think? Absolutely. I mean, during the general election, the official positions of both parties on Brexit, both big parties, very similar. But... The penny dropped for Labour that one of the reasons it did so well in the general election is lots of those who voted to remain in the EU decided that Labour might possibly be moving in a more pro-European direction. And, you know, I suppose uh, under pressure, they are now. So, as you say, they are going to vote against mm. uh, this bill, a really important bill, which is essential to getting us out of the EU. But also, very importantly, the Labour Party is now in a position where it is committed to staying in the European single market and the customs union during a transition period after the formal exit period. And again, that is very different from the government's position. So they're quite material uh, shifts yes, in yeah, I mean, I, and, and my own view is, for what it's worth, that Labour will, over the course of the next year, shift in an even more pro-EU uh, position and might end up 
indeed not inconceivable, you know, eventually saying that it wants to stay in the EU. But they're a long way from that at the moment. Um, and news tonight of a Brexit-related leak. Yes, that's right. So The Guardian has got hold of a draft white paper on immigration. No huge surprises um, in this leak of proposed government uh, policy. Um, and I think both Brexiteers and those who are keener on the EU will see things they both like and dislike. Um, the Brexiteers will take heart from the fact that it will definitely, if this becomes official policy, become much harder for non-skilled European workers to come to the UK and then bring family members over. So in that sense, much tougher on immigration. But the paper does open up the possibility of there being more favourable treatment for EU workers compared to workers from outside the EU. You'll probably remember during that very heated referendum campaign, lots of the Brexiteers said they wanted parity between Europeans and non-Europeans. OK, Robert, thanks. Nice to have you back again. Thank you. I've been getting away with